Hi, my name is Alexa Arena. I'm Google's district lead for San Jose. Welcome. Thank you for your interest in learning more about the Draft Downtown West design standards and guidelines. We're going to go through a host of things with you today, starting with the schedule and process. We'll then go through a project overview and update on our vision, which underpins the Downtown West design standards and guidelines. Those design standards and guidelines create a pathway for how we're going to implement the project. We'll also go through with you some other things you need to know and some next steps on continued engagement. So with that, I'll jump right in. Where are we in the process? About a year ago, we submitted our framework application. That kicked off a more formal set of studies, which leads to our release today. The framework application came from thousands of conversations with you all that helped us hone into what we really wanted out of the site, which was much less the corporate campus or the financial district and much more a resilient neighborhood. We'll go through that with you in a bit more detail. Today, we're publishing those draft documents for public review. We know there's a lot, and we're hoping this video helps you get through that. We'll have a series of meetings to get your feedback and iterate the documents, the first of which is the Development Application Community Meeting hosted by the city on the 19th of October. This all culminates into a spring consideration of the project in front of City Council, so we're excited to get started with you on this next level specificity. Jumping right into what's included, as we discussed, the draft environmental impact report will be released by the city, and it's a state-required study that informs city and state agencies and the public of any significant impacts on the environment resulting from the project. We're also submitting a host of documents that collectively are our application for the site, the central one of which is the de design standards and guidelines, which regulates us for the long term on how we implement the design and the vision. So let's jump right into the vision. The vision here is to really build a resilient neighborhood that captures the essence of San Jose. Deconstructing what we mean by that, this particular axon shows a 3D model of our framework plan. It's a simulation of the maximum amount of density following our design standards and guidelines. We absolutely took to heart people's anxiety that we would create a campus here and a closed campus at that. We will need to move towards creating a central social place, somewhere where all of San Jose wants to gather, feels included, is a part of. One that acknowledges both that physical part of buildings and great buildings, but also the programmatic elements that make communities stronger. We know now that that's more important than ever, and we think very much about the social infrastructure in the place first, and then think about the buildings as supporting that. Jumping right into that theme, the framework plan held so much of a foundation around that essence. We took the additional capacity afforded to us through increased heights, and instead of increasing the amount of office space with it, we actually took most of it and allocated it to other uses. Residential is a strong component of that other. It's the part that builds a neighborhood, a place where people call home. It also is through a series of the purple buildings, which are an aggregate of cultural and historic buildings and newer smaller scale buildings, which help to create identity and place and break down scale. We know that's really important to create a constant buzz and a constant life to this location. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, we brought an open space network that heavily leans on the ecological history and the desire for people to have access to nature, even in our center cities. We think this is critically important to help people live healthy and resilient lives. We shouldn't have to drive in a car and go out of the city to get that experience. It should be part of our daily lives. So we're really excited to bring that to the site. With that said, let's look at some of the numbers that break down the plan and underpin it. The plan is about six and a half times the amount of housing than what was under the original DSAP. That's a significant change. It brings thousands more families and homes. We're partnering with the city to contribute to the goal of 25% affordable housing within the overall DSAP, creating a more inclusive part of downtown. There's roughly a half a million square feet of retail, cultural, arts, education, what we call active uses. These are the uses that bring life to the ground and gives us 
an opportunity to constantly engage and connect with each other. If you think of that at scale, a normal small business or retail is somewhere between 1,000 and 5,000 square feet. Of course, cultural arts and education users can be bigger and scale up, but it shows you the level of significance of density that we can get on the site for a lot of activation and to create that social heart. As we discussed, there's also 15 acres of parks and open space. And importantly, part of that network is giving a variety of acreage back to expanded riparian habitat and to ecological resources. We think this is important not only to nature and the environment, but to people. If we can't have closer access to deep and immersive nature, we're not going to live the type of healthy and resilient lives we're after. There's a lot of literature on this that we're happy to share with you. We also feel really confident at getting to zero net new emissions. Doing that is a huge step forward in our fight against climate change, which we can experience so acutely in Northern California today. We assured you that we would work to find business models in order to handle some of our biggest crises and social issues that confront us today. And we think this is a big innovation to help get us there. We want to thank the city of San Jose for working with us on models around microgrids and even creating a water capture system on site to treat our water, which helps us achieve this goal and create a model that we hope expands well beyond our boundary and well beyond San Jose. We think this is a really good sign that we're all on the right path together to make this something that is about San Jose, not about Google. So with that, I want to jump into how we realize and deliver on this project. We're going to talk to you a lot about design today, but really that design is the reflection of the type of experiences and the programs and partnerships that we want to realize on this site. We have a design team that doesn't think about the building and the object first, but thinks about the ground, the civic life, the public realm up, and it helps influence the design outcomes of what you're going to see today. That people first approach is so critical to us because we can't achieve it if we think building down. And we're really proud to bring on a group of people who are very cutting edge in this space, including Site Lab and Laura Cresimano, who you hear from shortly. That being said, we hope you can also see that through our renderings. We thought very carefully about all the feedback we've gotten from the community, the type of experiences people were after. A big theme people had was the learning layer. The idea that there would be immersive learning and accessibility and education for all generations within the site. We leaned into that idea in the Gateway Plaza. Gateway Plaza is framed around the Water Company building, an historic building on the site, and it runs along Santa Clara Street. So when you look at the public plaza, you'll notice it's highly flexible and adaptable. It's designed to have pop-ups, to have different events that rotate, that create a surprise and intrigue every time you come to the site. You can also see the ground floor of the office building that's holding a couple different programmatic uses. The first is a shared space between, in this rendering, two organizations, but that represents a broader dedication to having a consortium-like space for progressive nonprofits who are working through how to make technology and the tech industry more accessible. Those two in this rendering are Year Up, who's already taking space on the site and we're really looking forward to our continued partnership with, and the Tech Challenge, who does a phenomenal job thinking through how to combat social problems using technology. Behind that, you can see an auditorium. That auditorium is really leaning into an idea that we heard from you all as well. Real estate is one of the most underutilized assets we have, and it's one of the most expensive ones. So the idea here is to have a Google Auditorium, but one that's shared use with the community. And so it's constantly on and constantly utilized while the capital expense is borne by Google. That'll help just create more efficiency to the space and create more access to those types of resources, which we think is really appropriate for a learning center. The San Jose Water Company building can be a new model for how you can create a consortium of nonprofits and local organizations around STEAM. There are so many ideas for the Water Company building, and we'll leave this one open for community input. But we know that on the ground floor, we want a cafe, we want an openness so that people feel they can engage with that building and become part of whatever its future is. All of those components 
the programmatic vision, help inspire the design team on how the buildings should meet the ground, how they should relate to one another, how the public space works with building frontage. We're really excited about that type of thinking. Again, it's experience first with buildings as support to it, and we hope you see that in this type of rendering. We also wanted to think about that big picture. So with SiteLab, we developed five key principles for how we can measure the success of the design guidelines. The first is about making a 20-minute city. A 20-minute city isn't a new idea from us. It's a well-established idea around how you create the right type of resources and amenities for neighborhoods to thrive and be able to be truly walkable. We didn't think about the 20-minute city within our site itself. We actually took concentric circles across the site, which is very long, and captured all the areas around it and mapped the resources and the amenities that we would need to fill in within our site to help support that broader 20-minute city walk. It's a different way of thinking, and it's one that we think is really powerful. We also wanted to lean into a notion of streets being something that's more dynamic than just car-centric roadways. We know San Jose has been thinking about this for a long time, and we're deeply inspired by DOT and some of their thought processes. We know this is also one that's going to transform over time. So our focus was on how do we create the right type of streetscape today to support our needs but to make it flexible and adaptable and more welcoming? And how do we also make it live over time so it can adapt to that world of the future where we're less car dependent? You'll see a lot of that work through Laura's presentation today. We also absolutely wanted to lean into how nature can become a more meaningful part of downtown. You'll see that throughout the documents. But this is really an effort not just to have open space, but to help us change versus sustain the way we can live in cities. We're really excited about this work and we're excited about the district systems and the underpinning of some of our efforts to combat climate change through the project. We also want to fundamentally always start with people. As we discussed, it's about the human experiences up, not the building down. And it's also about sweating the small stuff. When we think about cities we love, we don't love a huge building typically. We love a moment. We love that small pavilion. We love the art center. We need to think about those things as much as we think about the building itself and let the two exchange. Lastly, we deeply respect who San Jose is. And San Jose has a spirit of creativity and entrepreneurship that is off the charts. So we want to honor that and be bold and different. We want to have a diversity of design and design ideas within the plan. So it isn't cookie cutter and it's very much of San Jose. So we hope these five objectives gives you a little bit to measure our own guidelines by and to help us gain feedback and insights on how we can make them better. With that, I'll pass it along to Laura Cresimano from SiteLab but I do want to thank you for taking the time to listen and to give feedback. Thank you, Alexa. I'm happy to be here today to be able to share with you all the latest on downtown West. Let's get situated. Many of you know the location already. What you see in orange here is downtown West, an approximately 80 acre site in San Jose located steps from Deardown Station, which is planned as the largest multimodal station west of the Mississippi. Immediately east runs Los Gatos Creek and Guadalupe River. This is what we start from. Fundamental to the approach of myself and my firm, SiteLab Urban Studio, is to work from the ground up. We work from what makes this spot unique itself, the creek, the rail, and the neighborhoods of this part of San Jose, so that what we propose could only be here. And we add these new ingredients of housing, office, retail, and more to create a new extension of the city of San Jose, one that is connected, diverse, and resilient. So when we look at this site, downtown West is long and skinny. You see it outlined here in a black dash. It's about a mile from north to south, and it sits, as I said, between the rail and the creek, but also between a number of neighborhoods, with each edge a different character and opportunity to connect. As you can see in our design for the framework plan, this is not an office park or enclave. The streets connect through. Office, shown in blue here, is predominantly along the rail. Residential meets residential. You can see that in yellow. And then smaller buildings in pink, historic and new buildings, create contrast and act as anchors for activity, 
education, and neighborhood amenities. These amenities anchor a network of trails, parks, and plazas that bring nature in and stitch downtown West together, as well as together with each nearby neighborhood, so that wherever you are, you are connected to the next experience and to San Jose beyond. The dotted circles you see here outline a 10 minute walk radius, showing how this long strip of land now becomes both a destination in and of itself, but also a connector. As Alexa described, this is an ambitious project with 7.3 million square feet of office and 4,000 to 5,900 units of housing, as well as the retail, cultural, and educational uses. This shows you an illustration of that program in three dimensions. It's not final design, it's not architecture, but it gives you a sense of scale of how this 80 acres can be transformed. So how do we make this a reality? I'm gonna share with you what the process is and why we're proposing this process and some of the highlights of the Downtown West design standards and guidelines. You'll hear me mention the DWDSG or the document, and that's what I'm referring to. Let me explain what that is. At 80 acres, we can't approach this project like a single building. With 10 different parks, over 30 buildings, and over three miles of street improvements, we need a process that will support an integrated design and that can be phased and evolve. We don't want a cookie cutter type place that's designed all at once. So we need a process that can respond to the context and set up an overall vision that can iterate and learn with each phase. So that's why we proposed what we're calling a hybrid process for Downtown West. On the left here you see with a single building, it's really about the architecture. So you're looking at final designs, the materials, where the doors are and the windows, and everything around it is already set. At the other end of the spectrum, a specific plan, usually created by a city, covers a larger area and sets general controls for land use and buildings. For Downtown West, we have more detail than the specific plan but not all the final designs like a single building. You wouldn't want all those 80 acres designed today. This approach allows us to be adapted for the future for a 10 to 30 year build out. It also allows the project to respond to new innovations and priorities while embedding the level of detail that addresses the relationship to context and sets the context for each phase. It also focuses on performance and intent. What's important when each piece buildings, open space, streets, and sustainability come together. Here you see what might be the typical process, from the city policy and the general controls that would be preset to the approval of a specific building design. For Downtown West, the design standards together with the Environmental Impact Report, Development Agreement, and a few other documents create a holistic set of requirements for approvals, tying all the pieces together. Then with each phase or piece of the project, the detailed proposal is measured for conformance against these documents and commitments. So what's in the design standards and guidelines and how did we develop it? It's an integrated holistic approach, so it addresses everything from buildings to streets and open spaces. It is deeply informed by your input. This helped us to set priorities across all of these aspects of the place. And we appreciate it all the time that you gave us. On land use and buildings, we heard many things from you, including the importance of it feeling like an anchor and extension for downtown, that it be scaled to support the pedestrian and feel good on the ground, and that it integrate new and historic structures. On open space, we had a lot of great input and engagement over the last two years. We heard about the importance of connecting the trail, of creating an open space network that serves the neighborhoods, embracing native ecology, as well as consistent activation and opportunities to engage with the ground floor of the buildings. For mobility, which ties it all together and creates access, we heard the importance of a connected street grid, making it easier to walk and bike and more support for transit and alternative modes of transportation. And on environmental sustainability, which is a topic that has now feels so much closer to home than it did even just a year ago. We heard that as a true concern for our future and for the day to day, that we need to create healthy places to live and walkable neighborhoods. So the Downtown West design standards and guidelines and the project as a whole is built on that input. And really it reinforced the foundation already set by the city. The Downtown West standards and guidelines follows on and works alongside 
the city's downtown design guidelines, and the Deerdon Station area plan, bringing in more detail and making modifications where needed to address the specificity of this site and this project. So let's jump in. I'm going to take you on a crash course through some of the highlights, mainly on land use and buildings, open space, mobility, and briefly sustainability. Please feel free also to go look at the documents as they're available on the city's website. So first with land use and buildings. Land use first and foremost establishes what can be built where. The program mix of office and residential and active uses that I shared earlier. These chapters also cover a range of topics from the ground floor experience, the architectural variety of the place, and in particular, they pay special attention to the creek adjacent neighborhoods and historic buildings. I'll take you through an example at the end of how some of these controls come together. We've required dedicated space to an array of active uses to create the energy and variety on the street and to serve the needs of the broader neighborhoods. These active uses can include anything from retail to restaurants, arts, education, and daycare, providing services that support walkability throughout this part of downtown. This is a big piece of getting to that 20 minute city that Alexa mentioned for downtown West, as well as the nearby neighborhoods. We've located these active uses in dedicated buildings, historic, existing, and new, such as the Water Company building or the former foundry at 40 South Montgomery. These are combined with open spaces and are particularly concentrated on the way to and from the station and along the creek. In addition, the ground floor of the buildings near the anchors, open spaces, as well as key neighborhoods, are required to have active uses as well, making an array of amenities available a short walk from any direction. But it's not just about what's inside the buildings that shape our experience. We've paid particular attention to the design of the buildings, the architecture at the first floor, how it feels when you're walking down the street, so that this place throughout will feel welcoming, safe, and enjoyable. A few of the ways that we do this is by requiring rhythm and height variety every 35 feet. This helps to avoid blank walls or monotony and incorporate the aspects of what we love in older cities. We also require transparency at eye level to create a strong connection from the street for both active uses and offices. It's not only the ground floor design though. We also require preferred materials and articulation that creates a sense of texture and depth through the rest of the building design, particularly the podium, to avoid generic or cold architecture, preferring the variety of materials found in downtown West today. That variety is also built into the framework plan itself when it comes to addressing heights. The project conforms, of course, to the height limits set by the San Jose Airport flight paths. These create a stepping from 180 feet in the north to 290 feet in the south. The plan further creates variety by the interspersed open spaces, the historic and new low-scale anchor buildings, and then additionally by juxtaposing office buildings along the rail with narrower residential buildings meeting the neighborhoods. What you'll see in the standards and guidelines document is a map like this, where each color represents a different height and the lighter and darker pinks show the reduced height areas. What I've described so far sets out some of the more universal rules that apply across the project, but each location in downtown West has a different context, and so we've established unique guidelines and standards to strategically respond to each. Here you see an overall illustration of the standards and guidelines and a representation of the density allowed in the project zoning. This gives an example of the outcomes of the massing or the basic volumes of the buildings. For the purposes of this introduction video, we're just going to focus on one important example highlighted here. The residential buildings shown in yellow across from West San Fernando and the VTA station and just north from the Delmas Park neighborhood. So if we zoom in to look at a bird's eye view of these blocks to understand how the requirements work, let's focus on E2 and E3 here. First, they are extruded to 280 feet, which is the maximum height in this case. Then we add a requirement of an average of a 100 foot setback along the western edge facing Los Gatos Creek in order to provide breathing room for habitat and for appreciation of the natural areas along the creek. Similarly, the project includes a 30 foot setback along the eastern edge of this block facing an engineered portion of the Guadalupe River. 
the DWDSG also works hand-in-hand -hand with requirements that already exist in the city's downtown design guidelines. In this case, the requirement of a 60-foot separation between towers. Then, on the edge facing the Lake House Historic District, we have additional requirements to create stepping of the building mass. If any part of the building is within 200 feet of the Historic District, it's capped at 150 feet of height, so it pushes any taller portions farther away. Additionally, we've added a layer to address the street wall. This is a 20-foot setback at 60 feet of height, so you get an extra bit of transition stepping down, and this requirement applies to 50% of that frontage. So you can see here in the main image, one example, but on the right, other ways that you could achieve that same requirement to create that layered stepping. All of this comes together to create what we'll call a building envelope. That's what you see here outlined in red. This is what's permissible to build within, but it's not an actual design or piece of architecture. So just to give you an example of what could fit within these set of rules and fulfill this intent, we can see these possible forms. This starts to establish a massing that based on how you might lay out a residential footprint and adjust the location of those different pieces of it comes together inside of that form. But you also layer on more of an architectural design, more of the articulation of the facade, as well as the detailing of, say, the, the windows and the materiality added on that starts to give it finer and finer grain. Of course, that's not the only option for how this building could be put together, and you see here a number of other options that could fulfill the same intent. Another example is this view from outside the Water Company building near Santa Clara. As you can see here, we can't think of this project as a collection of buildings. It's about how all of the pieces are layered one upon the other to make a great place, with the streets and open spaces as the glue that holds it together. So let's look at the open space. The design standards and guidelines here cover the what, where, and how of the parks and plazas as well as the trails. The Los Gatos Creek Trail is an incredible feature, but it's missing pieces right now, as shown here in this drawing of the existing trails. We heard this as one of the most important priorities for open space, to connect the Los Gatos Creek Trail network, which will further connect to the Guadalupe River Trail and stretch to the bay and to the hills. The project adds those missing links, those trail segments, as well as additional on-street bike facilities, just a fraction of which are shown here in purple. I will show the full network later as a highlight of the mobility chapter. There are a number of parks nearby downtown West, from the 250-acre Guadalupe River Park to the Cahill and Del Monte neighborhood parks. Downtown West strengthens the open space network of those parks with 15 acres of new parks and plazas and green spaces that are intentionally distributed to be immediately accessible from every direction. We've established these open spaces to complement the neighborhoods and the new Downtown West with more urban character in the center near the station and more green passive spaces along the creek. The different experiences are reinforced by standards that specify different plantings and vegetation based on location. You can see here that range from riparian plantings at the creek to oaks in the north with native plantings required throughout the open spaces. We also heard from you that you want to see many types of activities to make these spaces truly usable and to complement the parks that already exist. From passive areas for respite to strolling along a boardwalk to places to gather and play with your kids. I think we all feel how important this is now more than ever. Each open space, as a result, has a different combination of these features and activities required. Here you can see a chart from the document. Don't worry, you don't have to read it in this presentation, but essentially this maps out the requirements of each of those features for each park. So there's a set of required programs, but on top of that, there are additional complementary ones to choose from to allow flexibility for the future rather than finalize all of the pieces today. To give you a better sense, I'll walk you through our vision for one open space, the Los Gatos Creek Park, south of Park Avenue. You can see here that today it's hard to experience the creek itself. First off, the buildings are set away from the creek. Then within that space, 
We require, of course, the multi-use trail on one side to the north and a continuous walking path on the other. We also require understory plantains throughout, an overlook, and a plaza to anchor activities, among other features. All eight of the items shown on the left are required in this park. On the right, we have the complementary programs I mentioned. These include nature play, pavilion structures, kiosks, or artwork. Of those, two would be required to be included. So altogether, these elements create certainty of the intent and guarantee this park will expand the creek habitat, give ways for you to visit the creek and enjoy the setting, while still providing flexibility for the final design to respond to evolving needs and to your priorities. Here you get a sense of this one park, where we've zoomed in a little bit. This level of design specificity and requirements can be found in the document for all of the 10 parks and plazas in downtown West, altogether creating a network from this Creekside Park to the more urban gateway plaza on Santa Clara that I showed earlier. Connecting all of these parks and places is an improved street network. This brings us to mobility. Mobility covers everything from street design to parking and loading. It builds on the progressive work of the City of San Jose in their complete streets standards and guidelines, further adding a layer of character and intent and advancing the focus on pedestrians, on micromobility, and on ecology so that we can really bring nature in throughout. I'm going to focus on the overall network and show you a few examples. So here this shows the existing street network. You can see that there are several important east-west connections connecting downtown San Jose to west San Jose like Santa Clara, Park Avenue, San Carlos, but the north-south connections are quite limited. We proposed streets to extend and connect the existing network, adding those north-south connections and grid redundancy. This means we have more variety and better access. We further increase walkability through adding additional pedestrian routes, shown in dotted lines here, including the trail connections mentioned. With this, there will be many more choices to connect from station to neighborhood and beyond. One of those choices is micromobility, primarily getting around by bicycle or say by scooters. Downtown West will add over three and a half miles of new or improved bikeways. That's the pink you see here, the dark pink, which is all designed to connect in to the city's larger bicycle network. It's about function, but it's also about how it feels. If we do start with people, we start with priorities of safety and comfort. So the majority of the bicycle network I just showed is designed with separated bike lanes, in many cases buffered with trees and plantings. We've also concentrated how the different transportation choices connect. We include what we're calling mobility hubs at every transit stop, where at least three amenities are required. These might include transit shelters with real-time arrival information, short and long-term bike parking, or bicycle share. Overall, all of the streets are designed to support the functioning of all modes, but each street is different, from wider streets that need to have greater capacity like Bird Avenue to more intimate shared streets with slower movement like South Montgomery. They're all designed to be safe, walkable, and with a sense of nature brought in, as I mentioned. To get a sense, I'll share a quick before and after of these three to show the range. First with Bird Avenue. This is a high volume street, and it is an important vehicular connection for San Jose. It creates access from the highway. It's also very wide. It has six lanes with limited sidewalks surrounded by asphalt and surface parking. Our proposed Bird Avenue rebalances how the street functions. We maintain five lanes, given that this is an important connector, while expanding the space dedicated to the pedestrian and the bicycle. And that's what you see here in orange. It's the street design, as well as the street wall, where the buildings, together with the street trees, frame this street to feel safer and more engaging. Another example is West San Fernando. This street is also an important east-west connector, it delivers a key approach from downtown to the station, and the city is already prioritizing it for bicycles. In our proposal, West San Fernando maintains the same function, but extends the curb and moves those two bicycle lanes into the sidewalk distancing them from the car and adding dedicated space for trees and plantings to make them safer and to make the overall experience better. Meanwhile, what we propose for South Montgomery Street close to the station 
provides an example of the slowest and most in intimate end of the spectrum here in downtown West. Currently, it's two travel lanes with on-street parking. As proposed, it would still be two travel lanes. But because we've reconnected the network, this central street in the core can be converted to a true shared street. This is an idea that has been implemented around the globe, and San Jose is already starting to implement their own shared street at Park Avenue. In a shared street, cars can pass, but the focus is on the pedestrian. As you can see here, it's made curbless. So what that means is that the entire street is basically designed like a contiguous sidewalk. Of course, there are still distinctions through trees and bollards and other street furniture to help make sure people understand where cars might be passing and to enliven the street for everyone walking down it. In all of our design for the street network, we wanna make sure we're preparing for the future by building in flexibility and adaptability. We've designated what we call a dynamic lane next to the curb. This is where there is a lane that can flex based on traffic levels, peak or non-peak, as well as over the long term. So different components could be swapped in, whether it's extending the streetscape and creating seating, or space for rideshare drop-off, or more plantings and vegetation, or even space for future technology for transportation that we don't even know about yet. Overall, the goal here is to support all modes and make healthy, safe, and compelling ways to connect to and through downtown West. Finally, I'll touch briefly on sustainability, though these few slides will only scratch the surface. Within this document, this chapter is a little different. It essentially provides a summary for how sustainability is integrated throughout all of the other chapters and the project commitments that will make this project truly a model for environmentally sustainable development. This couldn't be more important. Fundamentally, Downtown West is committed to creating a net zero urban community. That means that the project will have no net added greenhouse gases. This will be a major accomplishment for a project of this scale, and it's really going to take strategies at every level. That includes district systems and infrastructure, like generating a minimum of 7.8 megawatts of solar energy, attaining LEED gold for all office buildings and LEED certification for residential buildings, encouraging non-vehicular mobility, and planting over 2,000 new trees. At the end of the day, design is the container. And it's not about any one of the elements I described or any one of these specific rules. It's about how it all comes together to create a seamless part of San Jose that supports the health and resilience of its people. Alexa will share with you how to learn more and share your thoughts. We look forward to hearing your feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Laura, for going through all that with us. Super helpful. There are two links in this slide. The first one is to the city website, which will have all the different documents for you to read through. The second is to Downtown West's website, which will have ongoing engagement, our first exercise of which will be posted shortly. Please check back with Frequency. We'll be continuing to post new exercises to the Downtown West website, in addition to blogs and thoughts that are in direct response to some of your thinking so we can iterate together. We really appreciate your time and your collaboration with us to get all of this right. And we want to hear from you. So please do participate and let us know your voices. We're really excited to make this a better document with you. Thank you so much from your time, from the entire Google team. I can't express how appreciative we are. We can do this together, but we can't do it alone. So thank you.